Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. And thank you for the people are in the live streaming. <laughs> thank everyone. I'm Benedetta. I've been working for the Information Lab for the past uh, four or five years now. I've been through the data school, which we, it's a program, a training program, uh, which teach you how to extend Tableau. We are very happy to talk about the program after, so just look for me. Uh, tonight we have two incredible speakers. We have Sue, which is coming all the way from Cleveland. She's the founder of Funding Ada, which is a platform for mentoring that connects mentors and mentees, and also the founder of Ada Lovelace Day. And then we have fantastic Isabel. She's a senior architect at TFL. We're going to pause for the Q&A after Sue's speak, uh, speech, and then we're going to do a, a joint one. Okay? Thank you for coming, guys. Uh, well, thank you everybody for um, coming. This is uh, a great turnout given the um, current situation. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm the founder of Ada Lovelace Day. Um, back in 2005, I also started a group called the Open Rights Group, which campaigns on, on digital rights. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of very much a social technologist. So I like looking at how technology um, can change uh, social issues and have an impact on social issues. So at the beginning of most of my talks, uh, most people have two questions. The first one is, what is Ada Lovelace Day? And the second one generally is, who is Ada Lovelace? And so today I'm actually gonna start with the second question first. Um, the story of Ada Lovelace is, is a fascinating one. Um, and unfortunately we can only do it the, uh, the briefest of overviews today. Um, but to understand Ada Lovelace, it helps to understand her parents. Uh, she was born Augusta Ada Byron, and she was the daughter of the romantic poet George Gordon, uh, who you probably know better as Lord Byron. Uh, he was a romantic poet, I'd say he became very famous when his uh, poem Child Harold's, Child Harold's Pilgrimage was published in 1812. Uh, he was basically the first celebrity and he was described as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. He was a very difficult man, he was very moody. Uh, he was the son of difficult parents. So his father was Captain John Mad Jack Byron. I think there's a hint in the name there. Uh, and his mother was the heiress, uh, Catherine Gordon. She was incredibly wealthy when she met Mad Jack and considerably less wealthy uh, once she'd known him for a while as he squandered all her money. Now, Annabella was a very different person. She was a very kind, very caring person. Uh, she was socially progressive and she started schools uh, that focused on kindness and cheerfulness and that banned corporal punishment, which for that era was uh, incredibly unusual. She was very intelligent, uh, educated by Cambridge University professors she studied classical literature, uh, philosophy, science, and maths, and she loved maths. Now, she first met Byron when she was 19 and he was 24 and thought she had no romantic interest in him at all. Um, but ultimately, she fell in love and became, as her biographer, Julia Marcus, put it, the very good girl determined to save the very bad man. Now, Annabella and Byron got married in uh, 1815 in January uh, of that year at a private ceremony at her parents' house. Uh, Byron was so thrilled to be getting married that he was several days late to his own wedding. About nine months later, on the 10th of December, 1815, Ada was born. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the marriage, her parents' marriage, didn't last much longer. Uh, Byron drank, took laudanum, threatened his wife, uh, his mood swung erratically. Uh, he used to carry two pistols and a dagger at all times, and uh, that made his threats against Annabella just maybe a little bit too terrifying. Um, so eventually she fled to her parents, taking the one-month-old Ada with, them, with her. Now, Ada, as a child, uh, would spend hours looking at diagrams and reading periodicals and, and learning about new inventions she became captivated by machines. By the age of 12, she developed a design for a steam powered flying machine, 14 years before William Henson came up with his aerial steam carriage. But 
that Annabella was concerned that Ada might inherit some of her father's poetic tendencies. And to combat this, she had Ada schooled in maths and science to try and prevent any inherited madness coming through. <laughs> and one of Ada's teachers was Augustus de Morgan. Uh, as a mathematician and a logician, he was very impressed by Ada's capabilities. Had Ada been a man, he said, she would have had the potential to become an original mathematical investigator, perhaps of first-rate eminence. But de Morgan worried about Ada's health. This was an era where your mental health was thought to be related to your physical health. And Ada had been a very sickly child. Uh, she'd suffered headaches that obscured her vision, which were probably migraines. Uh, she was later paralyzed by measles and was confined to bed for a year. And de Morgan said, the very great tension of mind which they, the maths problems, require is beyond the strength of a woman's physical power of application. But Ada was a character and she did not let that stop her. She became friends with and uh, was taught by Mary Somerville, another mathematician and astronomer. Now, Somerville had become famous in her own right um, because she translated the five volume Mécanique Céleste by Pierre Simon Laplace. And that her translation was called The Mechanism of the Heavens and it was published in 1831 by the wonderfully named Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. Now, Somerville was instrumental. She really changed Lovelace's life in a way that I think she could never have predicted because in 1833, when Lovelace was 17, Somerville introduced her to Charles Babbage. And Charles Babbage was another mathematician, an inventor, mechanical engineer, and a, uh, a very keen campaigner against street music. Uh, <laughs> in fact, Babbage hated street music so much that one time he heard musicians outside his house and he went outside to berate them without his hat. It actually caused, caused a real scandal. Um, now, when Babbage was at school, uh, he studied maths for navigation and accounting. And he learned that incorrect calculations in navigation not only could, but did cause shipwrecks. Babbage wanted to build a machine that could accurately calculate and print the mathematical tables that were used by uh, ships navigators. And these tables needed to be free from error. Now, at the time, they were calculated by computers, that is, people who compute. Um, and they were prone to error. And there was a case of a shipwreck um, that Babbage would have known about off the uh, coast of Cornwall that was put down to errors in the astronomical tables. If these tables were worked out by his machine, which he called the difference engine, then they would be perfect and lives would be saved. And the British government agreed that this was a jolly good idea and they gave Babbage £17,000 to, to develop this uh, difference engine. That's about £1.7 million in today's money. Unfortunately for the British government, Babbage ran into some issues with his engineer and ended up abandoning the project completely. Um, so the British government never got their, their machine and they never got their money back either. Um, he moved on to bigger project, a better project. It was called the analytical engine. And this was a general purpose computing machine. It would use loops of punched cards like a Jacquard loom, and it could be programmed via those cards to do quite complex calculations. It had everything that you would need for a modern computer. So it had an arithmetical unit, it had conditional branching and loops, it had integrated memory, and he even designed a printer for it. It was a much more important machine than the difference engine, but like the difference engine, it was also never built and he never properly finished the design. Part of that may be because he got a little bit easily distracted. Uh, so he actually spent a whole year perfecting the mechanism to carry a one. But Lovelace was fascinated by Babbage's work um, and she became an expert on the analytical engine. And Babbage appreciated her skills as well. And it said that he himself spoke highly of her mathematical powers and of her peculiar capability, higher, he said, than anyone he knew to prepare the descriptions connected with his calculating machine. 
Babbage even joked to Michael Faraday, that Michael Faraday, that Lovelace was, and I quote, the enchanted maths fairy. That enchantress who has thrown her magical spell around the most abstract of sciences and has grasped it with a force which few masculine intellects could have exerted over it. And that she did. In 1842, Babbage gave a lecture at, about the analytical engine at the University of Turin. And in the audience was Luigi Menabria, who was another uh, mathematician and engineer. He took notes, which he published in French. Um, and when that came to Charles Wheatstone's attention, he asked Lovelace to translate it into English because Lovelace was fluent. So in winter 1842, she began her translation. Now her knowledge of the analytical engine was far deeper and more detailed than Menabria's, so she quietly corrected some of his mistakes as she went along. Then in early 1843, when she showed her translation to Babbage, he was delighted and he encouraged her to add her own footnotes as she understood the machine so well. Her footnotes tripled the length of the original paper. Now in her expansion to Menabria's paper, she outlined several fragments of uh, computer programs, including one to calculate Bernoulli numbers, and this is known as note G. Now she could have picked any series of numbers, the fact that it's Bernoulli's doesn't really matter, but what she did was describe how to break the algebra down into simple formulae that could be calculated using the basic mathematical instructions. So just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. She also prepared the instructions for <coughs> encoding the punched cards. Uh, and those punched cards would have actually controlled the analytical engine. Now, although there were earlier sketches for the program by Babbage, Lovelace's were the most elaborate, the most complete, and also uh, no due, was the first computer program ever published. So Lovelace is often seen as the first computer programmer. I think what's more important than her program, as groundbreaking as it was, was her vision. She understood that the analytical engine was streets ahead of Babbage's earlier difference engine. She was very keen to make this point. So she says, the analytical engine does not occupy common ground with mere calculating machines. In a conceptual leap, unparalleled by any of her peers, she understood that if the analytical engine could manipulate numbers, it could manipulate symbols. And that would open up what she said was a huge new areas of mathematical science. Now symbolic logic underpins modern computing, but then it was an emerging field. And it was her friend, Augustus de Morgan, who was at the forefront of that field. Now Lovelace's culture still really hadn't developed an idea of a machine much beyond the automaton a clockwork ensemble that mimics life, but it can never create new behavior. Um, these three are the musician, the draftsman, and the writer, and they were created by a Frenchman called Pierre Jacques Droz. They are controlled by a series of cams, these shaped rotating discs in the back, and the size and shape of the cams control how the automaton moves. So they mimic writing and drawing and music, but they can only do what they're told to do. Now, Lovelace would at least have seen Babbage's Silver Lady, which was a female automaton that could bow and put up her eyeglasses at intervals as if to passing acquaintances. But she realized that the analytical engine could do a lot more than what it was just told. It could work things out for itself. And she says, I want to put something in about Bernoulli's number in one of my notes as an example of how an explicit function may be worked out by the engine without having been worked out by human head and hands first. That was the important sentence. That is the most visionary part of her paper. This, this ability to work out an answer based on inputs and the algorithm that hadn't been programmed in first was nothing else could do that. This was the true difference between the analytical engine and everything else that had come before. And she realized that if that were the case, then it could do more than just calculate big tables of numbers. It could potentially make art. The analytical engine, she wrote, weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. And it would be also capable of creating music. 
if you could understand the laws of harmony, if you could work out how to instruct the analytical engine to compose, then you could make any length of a, a piece of music you know, of any degree of complexity. No one else was thinking like this at the time. Now, Lovelace didn't work alone on these notes. She can, can collaborated with Babbage. Um, the post in Victorian England was delivered several times a day. Uh, Babbage was living in London. She was an hour away in Ockham Park. So sometimes they had a personal messenger that would go back and forth. And their letters were sometimes quite short and terse and they were rather like modern day emails. In one, all Babbage says is, return sheet with two corrections, write about card requiring new variable. Now Babbage unfortunately lost a crucial part of note G, the um, Bernoulli program. And so not only can we think of Lovelace as the first computer programmer, we can also see her as the first computer programmer to wish she'd taken a backup. She wrote to Babbage, I suppose I must set to work to write something better if I can as a substitute. The same precisely I could not recall. I think I should be able in a couple of days to do something. However, I should be juicedly inclined to swear at you, I will allow. Now, once Babbage had this, he replied, uh, I like very much the improved form of the Bernoulli note, but can judge of it better when I have the diagram and notation, which I think is important because it really does show that Lovelace was driving this program. She wasn't just transcribing what Babbage was saying. It was her idea and her understanding of what the analytical engine was that were driving this. And she refined her notes, often working 18 hours a day, and in August 1843, they were published in Taylor's scientific memoirs to great acclaim. Minabria asked Babbage to pass on his congratulations, and Michael Faraday told Babbage that the paper was so complex that it was over his head. But no one really paid that much attention to what she'd done. No one carried on her work, and it wasn't until Alan Turing in the 1940s uh, started working on modern computers that her achievements were rediscovered and recognized. Um, and in his paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, where he explores the question, can machines think? Uh, he refers to Lovelace and talks about what he calls Lady Lovelace's objection. Uh, she had written, the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform, which he took to mean that she thought machines couldn't learn, couldn't be created so that they could learn. Um, but, as he points out, the evidence available to Lady Lovelace did not encourage her to believe that machines could be so capable. But she was working not just a hundred years before him, but completely without a functioning computer. She could never test her work. She could never iterate. It's hard to know how she would have fulfilled her ambitions, her potential, because unfortunately she died in 1852, aged just 36. Uh, probably of um, ovarian cancer. And that was just 10 years after she published her paper. So for me, she was a natural candidate to become a figurehead for uh, a day celebrating women in science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, and so this brings me on to the first question, which is what is Ada Lovelace Day? The first Ada Lovelace Day um, was held on the 24th of March in 2009. And originally, it was a day of blogging about women in technology, but it rapidly grew into a day to celebrate all women in STEM. And my goal was and still is to encourage girls to study STEM subjects and to encourage women and to support women who are already working in STEM. The day itself is now held on the second Tuesday of October, uh, which this year is the 13th, which means you have lots of time to get prepared. Um, in 2010, we held our first event uh, and now it's an annual fixture. So we run Ada Lovelace Day Live, which is what I like to call a STEM cabaret. We showcase the work of seven women across STEM from academia and industry. Um, and they give 10 minute talks about their work or their research. We've had everything from talks about laughter to climate change, growing bone grafts, uh, and whether computers can learn to identify beautiful places. Uh, we've frozen things live on stage, covered things in whipped cream, and we've set things on fire. Uh, so we do try to be entertaining. Around the world, people hold their own events. Um, this just happened organically. It was nothing that I planned. Um, and last year, we had uh, nearly 180 events in 117 towns in 21 countries with something on every major inhabited continent. 
a special shout out has to go to the Fundacion Pro Acceso, who organized 68 events in Mexico City, uh, which is a huge number for a single organizer. Um, over the years, we've had probably about 830 events altogether. Um, but we do a lot more with the day than just events. Um, we've done a variety of projects to support and promote women in STEM. Uh, we did a couple of books, um, anthologies of biographies of women in STEM. Uh, we've done quite a few posters as well. We've got careers posters, which are very popular with schools and universities, and they're part of a free education pack. So all of this can be downloaded from our website. Um, so these posters are, uh, the intent is to explode the myths about careers in technology and, and science, because there are a lot of stereotypes. You know, people think that a scientist is someone in a white coat who stares down a microscope, but actually there are a lot of careers. Uh, in the same way with technology, people think that technology is just computer coding, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, our most recent poster is this one about jewellery, which is trying to encourage girls to think broadly about where they can find a STEM career, that there are STEM careers in the jewellery industry. And then our amazing, uh, enormous STEM careers poster is, is a very, has a very similar intent. It's to show people that studying STEM opens doors and gives you access to a very, very wide variety of careers. Uh, then we have um, obligatory poster about Ada Lovelace and uh, my favorite, uh, Mary Anning, who was a, a paleontologist who discovered ichthyosaurs. We did a podcast for a couple of years talking uh, to women about their work and talking about historical women. We've even done free crochet patterns um, mm -hmm. because we know that stereotypes, uh, children as young as four understand stereotypes. And if we can get very young children to see themselves and find role models and see themselves as women in STEM, then they will be less likely to self-select out of STEM as they grow older. Our biggest project to date is this, the Finding Ada Network. It's a new online mentorship and knowledge sharing network for women in STEM. And so I'm gonna spend like the last kind of uh, few minutes really talking about the power of mentoring because I spent a couple of years researching mentoring and, and putting together the Finding Ada Network. And it is astonishing to me that everybody does not already have a mentor. Now mentoring can mean different things to different people. And for us, what it means is a long-term structured relationship where the mentee has goals and tasks and checks in with their mentor for help and advice on a regular basis. And we do have decades of research to illustrate the benefits of mentoring. Mentees benefit from building a long-term structured relationship. Uh, it improves their soft skills, their confidence, their communication skills. Mentees develop better ways to process feedback and solve problems. Uh, they enjoy more peer support and their career prospects are much improved. Um, for example, through receiving coaching through a promotion process or a job application process. And mentoring is uh, very much a two way street, more so than perhaps people realize because mentors also benefit from being in these sorts of relationships. They improve their leadership skills, they gain new insights into their business and their industry, uh, they enjoy improved peer recognition and increased job satisfaction. Yet, despite this, 63% of women have never had a mentor. And this is odd to me. Why would you not want a mentor given all of these benefits? Well, the research shows that women have a few worries about mentoring and the mentorship process. The first worry is that women are concerned, women are concerned that their preferred mentor might say no. So women are actually very happy to be mentors and they're just not being asked. 71% of women say yes to any request to be a mentor. Most women would mentor more if they were asked, but they're not being asked. The second worry is that people worry that it's a time sink, um, that they're gonna get into a mentorship relationship and it's gonna take away from their day-to-day -day work. But that's actually not the case. When you talk to women who are actively mentoring, only about 9% of them say that mentoring takes time away from their own work. And I bet if you ask them if it was worth it, that they'd all say yes. Women are often also uncomfortable about mentoring because they feel they don't have enough expertise. <coughs> I don't know enough to be a mentor. 
particularly around technical and subject matter areas. They feel they're not senior enough, but that's actually, generally speaking, not what mentees are looking for. They're not looking for technical expertise. They can get that elsewhere. They're looking for help with soft skills like negotiation, influencing, managing interpersonal relationships. What we do know is that mentoring is really critical to career success and not just in the early years of someone's career. Again, some of the stereotypes around mentoring is that it's really only for young people being mentored by more senior people. But actually, one of the key risk points for women in their career is mid-career, 10 to 20 years in. That's when we lose women. And the Kellogg School of Business say, research shows that this mid-career marathon is a time when effective mentorship and sponsorship are critical. And a lack of good guidance increases the likelihood of a career exit for women. Now again, when we look at um, research and we look at what's happening to women, there was one study that looked at women in science, engineering and technology, and they reported that 80% of women love their work, but 56% leave their organization at the mid-level point in their career. In high tech, 41% of women quit compared to 17% of men. Now, these numbers don't make sense. If 80% of women love their work, why are 56% of them quitting mid-career? Why are 41% of women quitting compared to only 17% of men? What's going on? Well, when we look at the reasons why women leave, a lot of them are very mundane. So research shows that um, women leave because of a lack of opportunities to grow. So a lack of access to training and development opportunities, a lack of support from managers, so lack of support, balancing work um, and other responsibilities, especially. And poor career prospects. So difficulty advancing into leadership roles and a lack of access to creative and innovative roles. And if women can't see a career path, they will leave not just that job, but potentially that industry and go somewhere where they feel more valued. Now, mentoring can help with this. Um, not just by providing practical advice and information about how to tackle particular issues or situation, but also by providing kind of emotional and psychological support. And the importance of mentoring really shows up in the numbers. So mentors and mentees are both more likely to be promoted and to stay in their jobs. Mentorship provides a five times higher rate of promotion for mentees and a six times higher rate of promotion for mentors plus a 30% improvement in staff retention. And that's not just good for employers, that's good for employees, because one of the most stressful things you can do is to, to feel that you need to change jobs. So if you are happier in your job, you will stay in it for longer. And employers report that 58% of participants perform their jobs better. Again, that's not just a plus for employers, it's a plus for employees, because if you are performing better, then you are enjoying your work and, and we know that uh, happiness and performance are related the happier people are the better they perform so these things are all related and so this is why we started the finding Ada network um, it's our online mentorship and knowledge sharing network for women in stem so we provide our members with access to a world-class online peer-to-peer -peer mentorship platform uh, we provide exclusive content with careers advice, personal and professional development, as well as HR policy and advocacy advice. So we're very keen to get advocates for gender equality onto the platform as well. Like I say, we have decades of evidence that this works, that mentoring is beneficial for mentors and mentees as well as employers. And so I would just leave you with the encouragement to look for mentoring opportunities, either as a mentor or as a mentee, or in my personal opinion, both because there is no point in our lives when we don't need a bit of help from someone where we can't learn something and when we you know, can't help other people. It doesn't matter how junior you are, there is someone who will benefit from your experience. Um, so find yourself a mentor, be a mentor, and um, you know, look at the opportunities that are around you because um, it will make a difference, not just to your career, but also to how happy you are. So thank you very much for listening. And I also have to thank my wonderful sponsors.
Thank you so much, Sue. And sorry for you know, the interruption. We'll fix it now, <laughs> for sure. And yeah, Isabel. So usually at this point, when Emily was running this event, she was coming with a couple of jokes. <laughs> now I'm not as good. So Emily, you have a joke for us. <laughs> I mean, she had very good jokes. Not sure I understood all of them. Yeah, they were terrible. I'll steal a really old joke. Uh, what bug dealer loves data visualization? Pablo <laughs> 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 That's why I didn't remember the joke. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you so much for having me today. Um, uh, my name is Isabel Branco. I'm a senior architect. I work for Transport for London, although all opinions today are my own. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for coming along. Uh, thank you to the Information Lab and, and in particular to Louisa who invited me. And um, I mean, how amazing was Sue? She's incredible, isn't she? I have to follow that. Uh, I'm a low-tech person. I bring my own paper. And um, so let's, let's see where we can what we can do with this. Um, so, um, Louisa told me that uh, this was about data today. Well, I'm an architect. I don't know anything about data. I do know a little bit about dating, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'll just talk about dating. I'll talk about Tinder. I'll talk about red flags and, you know, <laughs> when to swipe left. Um, but Louisa said, no, no, it's about data. <laughs> we need to talk about data. So I, I, really don't know what to say about data, but um, I'll give it a go. <laughs> I thought, well, let's talk about something that I'm kind of an expert in, dating, and you are all experts in data. Let's see what's, what there is in common between dating and data. And I know you guys are fans of diagrams. Louisa tells me you're not fans of Venn diagrams, but here we are. I have a Venn diagram for you. <laughs> so uh, what's there in common between dating and data? What is it that I'm looking for and you're looking for? It's engagement. <laughs> um, so I'm here, to tell you about, I'm here to talk to you about engagement today. And uh, to tell you a little bit about engagement, I have to tell you about uh, myself, my origin story. Uh, so. I am, like I said, a senior architect. I work for TfL. I think I've worked there for about five or six years. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but um, I do, um, I have some pictures. I, uh, this is me. Mm -hmm. I'm the woman and everyone else is male, as you can see. I work with a bunch of men in engineering. Um, I work in behind the scenes stuff. So you will never see any of the architecture that I do. 
I like to call it my own hidden labor. <laughs> um, so this is what I do. This is the, the main part of my work. But my favorite part, the part that I really like, is the engagement bit. So it's a bit that I do kind of outside of work, but it's still part of work. So uh, TFL is structured in, well, TFL is an engineering company and a transport provider, as you all know. We probably all got here today thanks to work. You're welcome, by the way. Um, <laughs> we, um, we have in our um, organization seven staff network groups that work towards diversity and inclusion in the workplace. I'm not going to tell you all their names because I probably won't remember them. But anyway, I started to get involved with the women's staff network group uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and, uh, and to meet new people, you know, do things that I couldn't do on my own, um, get, get other women, meet other women and, and work with them. Um, and particularly meet people that are interested in gender equality. Um, so, oops, we went a bit too quickly there. So, um, I, I, the thing that really made me kind of jump into action, though, is uh, this event that happened in the Women's Staff Network Group. So we had this forum, and uh, at this forum, people, generally women, uh, could uh, ask questions, uh, give provide commentary, do whatever they wanted. And there was this woman uh, in particular that caught up and said, well, I'd like to talk about my situation. I work, I'm the only woman in a team of 12. Um, and for that reason, I get um, comments on my appearance, comments on what I wear, and I get given all of the um, menial tasks. So I have to make tea for everyone and I have to make photocopies and, and, uh, and, uh, provide stationery and that sort of thing. So um, is there anything that can be done about this? And uh, of course the floor was open for, for comments and, and someone raised their hand, a woman raised her hand and said, I kid you not, she said, if you wanna change things, change yourself first. Can you imagine hearing this when you've come, you know, when you're the victim of poor behavior, being told you are the problem. What could this woman change about herself? What was the problem there? Was her gender? Could she change that? Probably not. Um, so um, that made me very angry. And uh, like other angry people, I wrote a very angry email. <laughs> um, in which I said, this is unacceptable. You know, um, this, is, this is not okay. Uh, and I also tried to come up with solutions for it. And uh, this is where I tell you about one of my um, references, one of the women I admire most, and her name is Angela Davis. Some of you might know her. If you don't, you should really learn about her. She's brilliant. Uh, so she has a very famous quote, which is, I'm no longer accepting the things I can't change. I'm changing the things I can't accept. So I kind of tried to do that, not to the scale that Angela Davis does it, but my own small scale. So how do you start changing things? An angry email is one way, um, but there are other ways. Uh, I think it was a couple of weeks later, I uh, went to an event where the, the London Underground uh, managing director was, and I thought, oh, here's my chance. I, uh, I um, got in front of him and said, I need to talk to you about something. I need your help. This woman, there's this problem. We have this issue. Here's my solution. Will you help me implement it? And he said, yes. And yes is great. It's a great, I mean, it's engagement, right? We're looking for the yes. So, um, so I thought that was brilliant, but, but engagement from the top is great. What does it really work? I find that uh, it's great to have people like the managing director on your side, but uh, it's one of the smallest parts of implementing change. And actually change needs to happen at the grassroots. A lot more happens through creating a movement of people than through trickle-down feminism. Um, and that started my most active and productive period at the Women's Staff Network Group. I'd go to meetings and raise issues, ways of, resolve, of starting to resolve them because this is a big mountain we're climbing, we have to take small steps, we need realistic targets. And it was at one of those meetings that I met Louisa, who I'm going to talk quite a bit about. Um, so, and this is the first thing that about engagement. Well, find your passion is the one I have been talking about. So 
my passion is just being angry and shaking my fist at men. Um, <laughs> but find your tribe. And, uh, and Louisa and I are opposites. We're unlikely fellows. We're very different. We complement each other. I usually call myself the heart and Louisa's the brain. <laughs> what that means is that I will say to Louisa, oh, let's do it. How hard can it be? And she will tell me exactly how hard it can be. <laughs> and, um, but then she will also think of ways that it can be, that it can happen. So yeah, this would be my second suggestion to you. Find your tribe. Find the people that complement you, the people that are, some people that are the same as you, because it's brilliant to have people that are exactly like us, you know, get our jokes and everything. Uh, but also people that are different from us and challenge us in a constructive way, make it more fun. So Louise and I decided to focus on an area of the Women's Staff Network Group that was fairly neglected at that point. This was three years ago, maybe. It was our social media. We have internal social media at TFL, this piece of software that you might be familiar with called Yammer. I'm told that Slack or Convo are similar things. I don't know what these words mean, um, but we have Yammer. Apparently Yammer is like the granddad of all of these. Um, um, it gets a pretty bad rep, I think, but, uh, but it's very useful for TFL. Um, we have 30,000 people working in TFL. And uh, not everyone is sitting in front of a computer. A lot of people are sitting behind the wheel of a bus or uh, you know, driving a train or uh, welcoming customers and, and helping them. So how do you get to those people? We found that Yammer was the way to get to them or one way of getting to them. So we started to post um, fairly like regularly. We would post stuff that was quite controversial and stuff that was informative, stuff that women could relate to and see themselves reflected in questions like, have you ever said anything in a meeting and then had a man repeat it and get all the credit for it? I mean, let's have a raise of hands, a show of hands rather. Yeah, happened to me two weeks ago. It seems to happen every week now, but there we are. So uh, women could relate to this and started to participate and uh, whatever we threw at them got feedback. They were thirsty for this sort of conversation. And that's how we managed to get things like mind the pay gap trending. <laughs> And uh, we had a little uh, campaign, you might recognize this one, um, uh, where we got people to take pictures of themselves uh, with the Mind the Gap and, and some data, like there are more men named Dave in the FTSE, 50, 500, I don't know, then there are women, anyway, something like that. Um, so, and that kind of raised a few eyebrows, but it also made people aware of the pay gap and and pay gap day and when it happens and it's getting earlier and earlier every year, don't know what's going on. And then we got this um, International Women's Day selfie frame made and, uh, and that was incredibly popular. And again, you might recognize some people in these pictures. We got, uh, so these were incredibly popular. It was like this thing that had never happened in TFL and somehow these frames of which we had 10 traveled the length of and breadth of, of our transport infrastructure to get photographed in front of a bunch of people. And again, we started uh, to trend and uh, became famous um, and, uh, and get more and more people involved. And that would be my third tip is build an army. You can't do it. It can't just be the two of us. You can't just be the people here. You need an army to deliver change. Um, yeah. Um, so these are the key suggestions I have to build a, mo uh, a movement. There are other things that happen that you can capitalize on. So like I said, I'm the heart, Louise is the brain. I'm like that, you know, when you're driving and you see one of those um, inflatable men that do that, <laughs> I am that man. <laughs> and Louise is kind of the machine that makes everything happen behind that man. But I'm just, I'm just there waving my arms. And, uh, and because of that, I became kind of a celebrity in TFL. So even today, like two or three years after, people still come and talk to me and say, you know, I read this thing that you wrote, probably Louisa, but anyway, um, this thing that you wrote and I went to this event and thank you so much for the work that you do, you know. I don't do anything. I just get people to react, to, you know, drive off the, the highway and get over here. Um, but anyway, because of my um, acquired fame, I got um, elected as the first chair of Fight Club. So Fight 
stands for Females in Transport Engineering, and it's a subgroup of the Women's Staff Network Group um, focused on getting more women into engineering and kind of creating a better gender balance in engineering. Just for, for your information, I guess, we have 1,500, around 1,500 engineers in TFL. Most of them are men, most of them are white, and most of them are middle-aged and older. Um, and we have about 250 women. So these women felt isolated. So you saw, you saw my picture from earlier. I work and have worked for a very long time with just men, which is fun, but it could be more fun if there were women there, I think. Um, but lots of other women have the same experience and needed people to talk to and, you know, to say, yes, I told the joke as well. Nobody laughed. And then this guy told it and everyone laughed, you know. Jokes are really big deal for me. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is um, this is the creation of Fight showed us how much women in TFL were looking to connect with other people, work with others, share experiences, advice, learning, and opportunities. And through Fight, we managed to motivate women to mentor each other. I'm not going to say very much about mentoring because Sue kind of <laughs> took the wing out myself. <laughs> And, and also how to reach further in their careers. So there were people that applied for certain jobs because they were members of FIGHT that they wouldn't have applied for before. And they got them. Um, and also we, we built on STEM outreach. We, we have more, than, more, than, more STEM ambassadors than we've ever had before. Of course, women are, while well, women are the minority in engineering, engineering, they vastly outnumber men in STEM volunteering. Uh, we got the MD again, the guy I told you about before, to pledge to achieve 30% engineers in TFL by 2030. We're at 17%. Um, so, you know, we have 10 years. Um, uh, but this is a great aspiration to have. There are many reasons why it's hard to achieve. Um, and here is, again, why, wh where, what I do or what, what you do, data, and what I do, not dating, but engineering, kind of are similar. Um, we have a leaky pipeline. We try to feed the pipeline with uh, STEM careers at, at the beginning, and then when we get to the end, there's only a few droplets of women coming off. And uh, why is that? Um, why is that? Where are our leaks? Um, it starts with women not, going, not wanting to go into STEM careers or thinking that they have to be the best at STEM sub subjects to pursue a career in STEM. That is not true. Also, the fact that teachers and parents have greater influence than STEM fairs and STEM ambassadors. And often, they don't know what it is that we do. I mean, people think that all we do at TFL is drive trains. We have buses. <laughs> <laughs> Bikes. Um, then, access to employment and career progression. Ambitious women are perceived as aggressive and demonized, and a lot of women's labor is invisible and not recognized, <laughs> and uh, masculine traits are rewarded. Women have babies, and when they do, it's hard to get back into work. Often, it feels like work isn't made for women. So in TFL, for example, um, you saw me in orange. We use personal protective equipment when we go to site. It wasn't until about three years ago that we had personal protective equipment for women. We had to wear the men's equipment, which meant, you know, trousers that you had to roll up and your jackets went up to here, which makes it hard to walk up ladders, for example. Um, also, funny little anecdote, uh, when, uh, when they made boots for women, they had glitter laces <laughs> and they were called a vixen. Oh, yes, that's right. We had to complain about that. Angry emails. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so let me see if I've got everything. Yes. Aging women in the workplace are still treated as a novelty. When you're going through menopause and surrounded by men, how does that affect you? Brain fogs, heat flashes, heat flashes up, what happens? And uh, we can't understate the impact that society has on the roles that women have to carry out. 
Women are the primary carer, not only of children, but of elderly parents, chronically ill people and disabled people. So they're more likely to become economically inactive at a younger age or more frequently, simply because that's what's expected of them. So what lessons can engineering and, uh, and uh, fight teach people who work in data? Well, first, you need to understand what your group needs. You need to talk to each other, understand strengths and weaknesses, work out what keeps women away from data, aim to change that and empower each other to do more. Um, it does take an army, so build one. Work as a team, I said that before, but I'll repeat it. Understand what others can bring to the table that you can't leverage their skills. This versus this. Um, and uh, there's also strength in numbers. Uh, in union and also in unions. Uh, so tabloid workers have recently organized to protest work practices and work towards greater workplace and social justice. And I certainly hope that that becomes an epidemic and not one of those where we need masks. <laughs> um, and finally, what's the future? I think we need to work across genders, um, professions, join forces, and if we do, there's nothing to say we can't create a massive shift in society that sees us achieve greater gender parity. And now to finish, I will leave you with another quote from another influential woman that I love, um, as part of, a, of an activist collective in Australia. Her name is Lila Watson, and this is the quote, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting my time. But if you've come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, let us work together. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Now it's time for a Q and A. Cool. I'm sure you have loads of questions. Who's the first one? Emily. Hello. Hello, thank you so much for your talks. I found that really helpful. Essentially, um, I'm at a point in my career where um, I may be like five or six years in. Maybe the next step for me is I wanted to move into management. So I feel like, you know, it's definitely looking for sponsors to move into that sort of space. Um, I guess my question um, would be. Um, you know, whenever I've gone through this process and kind of find a good mentor, I found it really hard to find good fits. A lot of programs are like, I wish a pipe you so gay, you match you up with somebody. Can you tell me a little bit about like maybe some questions that would be like informative for finding a good match? I, I would find that really helpful knowing like, what sort of things should I be asking so I can figure out what's a good Um, that's a great question, and I think there are several aspects to a good fit for a mentor and mentee relationship. Um, the first is not actually about areas of expertise. It's actually more about personality and whether you get on with someone. Because um, a mentoring relationship is, can become quite a close relationship, and you need someone that you can trust and someone who empathizes with you. And so what I'd really be looking at first is rather than a state of questions is, do I have the opportunity to talk to some potential mentors and work out whether I like them? You can't have a mentor you don't like or that you don't trust. And it's very... Oh, oh. <laughs> I can chat with you, please. Hello. Um, so kind of working out what kind of 
person you get on with um, and looking for people that are similar enough to you that you feel comfortable with them but not so similar that you're just going to get um, everything that you think reinforced. So a little bit of difference might make you uncomfortable but it can be very healthy. And I think then in terms of how to assess a potential mentor is a case of are you moving roughly in the same direction and have they experienced similar things you are? Um, I'll shout. I'll shout for now. I can project. Um, but yeah, think about um, in terms of career position, don't go for anyone too senior. What you really need is someone who's been through what you're currently grappling with maybe two, three years ago, four or five years ago, soon enough or recently enough that they remember what it was like, um, not so far ago that um, everything's changed. Um, so really you want someone who's relatively close to you on a similar career trajectory um, that you think you can get on with. And don't be afraid of the mentorship, oh, thank you. don't be afraid if a mentorship relationship is not working out to say so and say, Thank you very much for your time, but I'm going to look somewhere else. Because, and, and you, you can explain why, but mentoring is so important that you have to find someone who's good fit. And if that takes a little bit of experimentation, so be it. Can I ask a follow up to that? Like, do you really have to tell this person, I want you to be my mentor? It just feels really like rough. Well, you you should, because women like it. <laughs> <laughs> women love being asked. Oh, so basically, you know, we've all been socialized as women to be helpers. So when someone comes along and said, could you help me? Like, yes, yes I could. So I think it's absolutely um, uh, valuable because it also creates a, a expectation management around what the relationship is. So informal mentors, um, where you just like go and have a chat every now and again, are, are great and fine, and lots of people have those without realizing they're mentoring. But a formal relationship where you actually say, will you please be my mentor? It's good for them as well. It's good, it is so nice when someone says to you, you know, could you help me with this? Because I think you have expertise I could benefit from. That's a wonderful thing to hear. And as women, women get that kind of validation very often. So don't see it as a request, see it as a gift, you know, you are, you're a bit set, what you're saying when you're asking someone to be a mentor is, I admire you. That's a wonderful thing to say to someone. So yes, <laughs> I think you should ask. Thank you. Well, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with everything. Cool. Second question. Um, in terms of asking for a mentor, do you usually ask for sort of a specific problem or set of problems and then ask for a certain period of time or is it relationships that kind of stay on for years and years? So the answer to that is yes. Um, all of those things are true. You can have, there are different types of mentoring. You can have what's called, um, commonly called flash mentoring, which is I have a specific problem that I need help with. And once the problem has been uh, dealt with in whatever way that relationship is, is closed, um, you can have, some people have mentors that they have for years and everything in between. You can have group mentorship where, you know, there's a, a little posse of, of women kind of going, okay, we all have similar problems. Let's get through it together. Um, you can have what I call process mentoring, which is um, that you have a, a very specific process, like getting a promotion is a, a key one that you need to go through. Um, and again, you, when it's done, it's done. So it really depends on what you need right now, uh, what you think you're going to need, and whether the same person can do both of those things. Um, um, but it doesn't matter in, in many ways because a lot of people get into mentoring through just uh, starting small. I have a particular issue I need to need some help with, and then that can develop into a longer term relationship if that is what both parties want. Um, so it's it's very flexible, and I think you, with the Finding Asia Network, the default is a 12 month mentorship, and it's a structured mentorship program um, because that's what we have 
uh, what has been found to have worked. And, and so that's kind of where we want to start people. But there's all sorts of different ways to structure it. And none of them are, none of them are wrong. They're all right. And it's all about what you need. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I have a question to both of you. So basically, do you think that this, not enforcement, but rather encouragement of the mentoring program has to come from the top? So do you think that would work if I would just approach my senior colleague and ask for help and they wouldn't know much about the mentoring program? Do you think they would be open for this? Or once it's been announced, it's one of the company cultures of having these mentoring programs spread that would work for you then? I think it's always worth, worth asking. Um, for me, uh, in, in TFL, we have this thing called performance and development and we have assessments every year. And it's really nice to be able to put in your p and that you've mentored someone. So I don't think anyone will say, I mean, unless they don't have any time, they won't say no. And, uh, and in, I'm going to pull, um, um, I'm going to pull things towards my presentation a little bit, where you have, there is, there is a lot of strength in grassroots action. And so if everyone's asking, then people will see, oh yeah, this is actually important. People are taking this seriously. And, uh, and the trickle down will start from there. That's how I see it. I would, I would kind of, if there is a mentoring program in where you work, use it. If there isn't one, start your own. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, thanks for the shout out and the embarrassing pictures, that's great. <laughs> um, I have a question for both of you, Ted, which is when you've been setting up your networks in your organisations, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? Just like specifically. <laughs> Not just by a group. <laughs> you do that so Okay. Um, I need to put my glass down for this one. Um, Ooh, where to start? Um, a massive challenge in my organization is getting to people who work on what we call the front line, people who are customer facing, people who drive trends. How do we get to them? So we talked about Vienna, it's not enough. Uh, I would say that we have to start working with unions, uh, but, uh, but uh, not everyone agrees with that. Uh, we have to increase our reach into, into, the, into the depths and the, and the breadth of, of, uh, of TFL. People work in, you know, zone six, and zone, I don't know how many zones there are, but there are many. Um, and, and people work very remotely from where I work, head office, you know, and, and it's, hard to, it's hard to get to them, and they often feel quite isolated, and so that's one of the biggest challenges. Now, speaking about other types of challenges, um, I think that, um, when you're working with other people, um, particularly in things that are parallel to your work, work in TFL is quite hierarchical. And so when you're working uh, with people that are your hierarchical superiors, it can become quite difficult to challenge them. And uh, you might have noticed that I'm fairly politically minded. And, and so um, my challenges come kind of from the left. And, and it can be quite hard to, to, to challenge people to do things that they're uncomfortable with when they're the ones that are going to rate your performance and development. Um, for me, those, I think, were the biggest challenges. I don't know about that. Um, so with the Finding Aid Network, so we only launched it mid-January, so it's still incredibly new. Um, and for us, because it's a public-facing and company-facing project so our aim is to get you know any women um and any advocate for gender equality regardless of their gender uh can join and you can sign up as an individual but for me the big challenge is trying to get companies on board 
and saying that you know we can um, we can spin up a, a mentorship program for you really quickly, and we can connect your staff with people in the wider world. Because if you're a relatively small company, one of the big challenges of doing mentorship internally is that your mentor might be your boss or your boss's boss. And then you start to self-censor because you can't say everything that you would like to say because this is the person who is in charge of your promotion and your pay rises. So there is a big sort of challenge about reaching companies and saying, you know, you can do mentorship. Um, you know, there are ways around some of these problems. And so for us, it's about scale and getting as many companies to get on board as possible. Um, and I'm very grateful actually to have to say uh, the information that will like my first go walk to come on board. And um, it's, it's awesome to, to have such a, a, a fantastic group of women engaged. But we're now um, University of York's bringing 40 ecologists on board. Um, we're working with JP Morgan um, to bring uh, 100 people on board. And so the challenge is really making sure we have enough people in the network so that those who come in as individuals find value and find someone that they can build a relationship with. Because you know, not everyone's right for everyone. So we need to have that breadth for it to become a truly valuable tool. Um, and I think as well, you know, there are also some issues around the stereotypes of what a mentor is. And this idea that mentorship is old white men mentoring new graduates is, has got to just die in a fire because that's not what it's about. <laughs> um, and that stereotype puts a lot of people off because they think, well, I, I'm good. especially young women, you know, well, you know, what am I just going to get talked down to by some CEO who has no idea what my life is like? Um, and the disconnect um, there can, can be huge. So, you know, part of our challenge is, is saying to young women, you know, this is people like you. You know, this is not, um, you know, someone who's waiting to, to retire. This is someone who has been through what you've been through and understands the position that you're in and understands, you know, the job market now is not the same as it was 50 years ago. Thank you. I really enjoyed our first presentation, it's very different. Um, right, so you talked about the leaky pipeline where you keep losing particularly women as you go along. Um, what would your advice be for those of us who left the pipeline around that GCSE, went on some mad arts, creative, very wonderful scenic route, but then suddenly at 34 decided they wanted to be a day journalist um, and are trying to get into that pipeline from outside, um, but are finding it a little bit impermeable because you don't have the qualifications or, I mean, I've, I've kind of been working on, um, I suppose, the fact that I couldn't really work an Excel spreadsheet um, and a bit of confidence, but beyond that, I'm trying to get into jobs now, which I do not have the qualifications for, and I want to get in and I don't know how and I don't know if anyone else in the river sitting in the same position. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, my aim career is, has been a senior recruit and then some. So you can make my career, it, it can be the noun of you know, your progression of your, your work life. It can also be a verb, which means kind of, you know, to uh, careen violently <laughs> from side to side. Mine's much more verb than noun. Um, so I, 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 I hear you and I hear where you're at. Um, I think the, the key thing is, firstly, the, the pipeline really desperately wants you. Really, 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 really desperately wants you. Um, so it's about working out um, you know, where your skills gaps are and how you can fill those skills gaps. And you know, there are a lot of, particularly in data, um, data analysis, there are a lot of opportunities for um, training and uh, you know, online and in person, and it's that kind of, if you can, again, you maybe find a mentor that can help you understand where those gaps are, then you can fill them and then you'll be in a better position to, to get those jobs. And I think um, we're just so crying out for um, any kind of uh, data analysis people that the door is there, you just have to kind of work out which one and, and how you're going to maneuver through it. Um, so, you know, keep at it and, and, and you will succeed.
look for programs that, yeah. uh, that welcome people in your situation. I wouldn't say that what you've done or anyone who's taken, made the same choices is wrong. I think companies need to support rather than a career ladder. I, I, some, I once heard someone talk about a, a career climbing frame where you don't necessarily have to go one way. You can go whichever way you want to and you'll get to the top. Um, so I think there's a, a, a massive job that companies need to do in building or providing that climbing frame for people. So don't feel like the onus should be on you because it shouldn't all be on you. There's, there's some development that you need to do, obviously. But I say, I'd say look for programs. In, in TFL, we have an apprenticeship program, a graduate program where we provide learning on the job, that sort of thing. So that might be a way in. That's, yeah, that's my suggestion. Anyone else have suggestions? Any suggestion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, for example, for in my case, I have, we all have, we have a men internal mentorship program as well, and we have like three four people per, per person. So uh, one woman just came to me asking, can, can you be my mentor? Actually, it was after Andy left. And it was the mentor. So she actually opened the door. <laughs> opened the door. Actually, she came to me asking. Yeah. I might not have thought about it, right? So it's not that I didn't want to ask her, but I just didn't think about it. She so apparently came to me and said, can you be my mentor? I really would like to, to be your key and everything. Any other questions? Yeah? Hi again. Um, I wanted to ask about engagement. So do you sometimes get the case that actually someone or like a woman in particular would really benefit from getting more involved in the activities that you have in TFL, but somehow they're quite actually reticent yes. to get involved. And like, yeah, could you talk a bit more, a bit about how you think those people are approaching it and what you've done that sometimes has allowed them to change their minds? I wouldn't say I changed anyone's minds. That's not what I would do, unless you're the greatest sex racist and you know, ableist. Uh, I will try my best to change your mind. Um, women want to do things. Women are very worried about how they're going to be perceived doing certain things. If I'm not the best at STEM, can I go into STEM? If I'm not, if I'm not, if I don't succeed at this, am I going to be a failure? And so I have to say to them, no, no you're not, come along, do the things you like. One of the important things about getting people involved is understand, listening, I don't sound like I'm a good listener, but I am, um, uh, listening to people and kind of seeing what sparks their passion and saying, you know what, I've been thinking about doing this, I think you should read it. If they don't feel comfortable reading it, you go, okay, well, I'll help you, we'll co-chair it or but then you don't, but then they have to do it. <laughs> and uh, what you find more often than not is that people just rise to the occasion and to the challenge because they're capable, what they're missing is confidence. So you have to kind of do some work in building up their confidence and, you know, quoting lots of amazing women and, uh, and uh, talking about how amazing they are so that they will understand that they're amazing is very important. So I think, yeah, building confidence is the main thing finding that little spark and making it into a fire and, um, and then kind of pushing them off the nest and saying, you know, you have to fly down. Do you have anything to add to? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> is someone asking, does someone raise their hand? Yeah, the back. Um, yeah, I So it's another question on uh, mentorship. So I guess we all can kind of imagine what a good mentor is, somebody who listens to you and gives advice and so on. But what is a good mentee and how can we be better, be better at being mentee as well? That is actually a very good question. Um, I think for my money, uh, a good mentee is someone who comes with an open mind and who is willing to be vulnerable because one of the hardest things that you have to do in a professional life is take feedback and take criticism. And that can be very challenging and, and very difficult. And so for a mentee, it is recognizing that your mentor has a perspective that that they have that is different to yours and that they are bringing experience and knowledge to the table and actually being open to thinking about things differently and when you are offered the opportunity to receive feedback to take that feedback um, and it, it, it surprises me I had a, a conversation recently with with someone who was offered feedback and said, oh, I don't want it. <laughs> and I understand why, because it is, it is challenging and difficult to receive feedback, but um, 
that's the only way you grow. Like you learn nothing from success. You only learn from the challenges that you face and, uh, and, and, and it's not even about whether you succeed at them, you know, it, you learn from being challenged. So being open and being um, uh, willing to change and being willing to take a risk because again, you don't grow from doing the same stuff that you've always done. You grow from doing new things and new things can be scary and they require you to be vulnerable and to take a risk and they require you to accept that failure is a possibility. But for my money, failure is never actually failure. The only time you genuinely fail is when you stop trying and when you stop learning. Um, I've had uh, businesses go bankrupt. I have had, um, you know, some really awful low points in my career, you know, that uh, as an adult, I ran out of, well, everything, and that's going to live with my parents, and, and that was an extremely challenging experience, but I would not be where I am now if I'd not been through those issues and, and, and not had to deal with rock bottom and, and look at it and go, done that now, don't have to be scared of it again, because... Here I am, I have survived, I have dealt with some pretty low points. So, you know, that's not to say that I expect them to go, go through that, but you have to be willing to. The chances are you won't. You won't ever have to deal with that kind of, um, uh, of a problem, but you have to go in there saying, okay, I could monumentally mess this up. So long as nobody dies, it's all good, right? <laughs> You, you can survive and you can carry on and you can, can learn from it and progress and you will be a better person for it. Um, so that went a little bit dark there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, be open, take risks and, um, and take feedback. And also don't forget that your experience is valid and valuable. Hi. Um, it's a question for both of you um, in your fields. We've talked about women here today. Um, I was just wondering that when you maybe are organising like a safe space for women in work or in mentorship, um, do you guys factor intersectionality within that and intersectionality and nuance within women? Um, like just earlier today, I delivered a presentation from a gender and society class. So I do a master's in global health. So we we're looking at the intersectionality of women of colour, women who have disabilities, both physical and non-physical, and how they present in like the workplace or um, in education or in or primary to secondary to higher education. And um, I was interested to see how different sectors in Britain especially tackle intersectionality um, as an issue in any type of workplace or any type of institution. So yeah, thank you. Oh, the dreaded I word. Right, intersectionality. Uh, as I was saying earlier, we're all diverse. Uh, people are diverse because they're from a minority ethnic background. All ethnic backgrounds make us diverse. Uh, all abilities or disabilities make us diverse. Uh, uh, all uh, genders make us diverse. Um, the idea of safe spaces, I quite like it. I try to implement a safe space for women at my workplace, still working on it. The intention is definitely there. Uh, it is important to center people whose experiences are normally disregarded. So women of color, yes, disabled women. Uh, people, with, people who are cognitively different, that tends to be kind of forgotten about. Um, we wanted to centre these people and make sure that they are included and they're not carrying out the bulk of the labour, which often happens as well. Um, um, listen to people, believe them, um, give them space to talk, but give them space to not talk if they don't want to. Um, it's very, very hard to create a safe space. I think as soon as you start to create one, someone goes, what about safe spaces for men? <laughs> and that's your first challenge uh, and then and then you have to kind of understand and be able to define what a safe space means it might mean different things to different people what is it, what is it that we're talking about uh, the things that 
uh, we discussed in, in, uh, in my workplace was things like um, bullying and harassment, um, poor falling behavior. Uh, yeah, just having a space to talk about that, not necessarily raise a complaint or file a grievance or anything like that, but just talking to someone and have them say, yes, that's happened to me as well. Of course, I uh, wanted to get my data as well, even though I'm not a data person. I was like, okay, this is the way we're going to show the business that there's a problem. Safe so spaces are good for that, but of course, only if people allow it and are willing to, 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 to have it be that. Um, we're working on it. It's hard. Uh, the way to make it as diverse as possible is to make sure that the people um, creating it, discussing it, uh, coming up with ideas are from from um, from as varied backgrounds and, and have as different as, as varied experiences as you can possibly get. I mean, fortunately, at CFL we have thirty thousand people. They're not all women. I'm working on it, uh, but um, <laughs> but we have quite a. Um, a diverse bunch, even though we could be better in, in some markers. I'm going to call it that. I know it's the wrong word, but here we are. Um, we 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 are we we don't know how many uh, how many um, autistic people we have. We well, we don't know a lot of information because people are often uh, don't feel comfortable disclosing that information, which again shows do people feel safe to disclose it? Perhaps not. Um, so a lot of the time we don't know. We try. We try to appeal to to, to as, as varied a group of uh, a population as we can. But it's. I think there's a. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling. But there there is an important thing, and I'm going to let you talk in a second. Um, uh, one important thing is to build people's confidence. If people trust you, then they will come and they will talk to you. Even if even if the safe space is a conversation between you and another person. That, that's a start, and and the most important thing, I think, is to build trust. Sorry, I don't know if that answered your question. Okay, so for me, I think the most important thing that doesn't get talked about enough is that diversity is valuable. That um, we perform better in diverse groups, uh, diverse companies perform better, um, and this is really because. When people bring different viewpoints, and it doesn't matter how they've come by that different viewpoint, whether it's that ethnicity or uh, gender or neurodiversity, that because they have a different experience, when they bring that to the table, they are bringing something valuable. And I don't think we talk enough about why diversity is important. Because whilst it's you know, morally important, it's it's important in so many other ways. Diverse teams produce you know, better results. Um, but the challenge there is that diverse teams are also less comfortable to be in. And not just for whatever the dominant majority is at the time. So when we're talking about um, diversity and about safe spaces especially, we also have to recognize that safe doesn't mean comfortable. We can be in a safe space that challenges us and helps us grow and um, you know, makes us look at some of our, our assumptions and stereotypes and prejudices. And that's not a comfortable experience. Um, but that doesn't, going through that doesn't make it not a safe space. Because um, I've got a, a long history in online community. So one of the key things is around having a robust code of conduct and enforcing it. And this is where we actually see um, a lot of problems coming up around diversity in the tech sector, particularly in-person um, events like conferences, that if they don't have a code of conduct or if they don't enforce their code of conduct, then people uh, who are in whatever type of minority feel vulnerable and they don't feel um, that they can trust um, that the people who are supposed to be looking out for them will. So codes of conduct are, are very important, but so also is nurturing community. The communities don't just happen. You know, if you put uh, a bunch of people in an online forum and just let them get on with it, you will end up with conflict and you will end up with prejudice and uh, aggression. 
So you have to be willing to step in. And that always, and, and I do have never been in a community that has not experienced this, it always results in discomfort for pretty much everybody. And it's not about trying to avoid conflict. It's about learning how to work through conflict, how to resolve conflict, how to de-escalate, and then how to bring people together once you've actually resolved the problem. So these are deeply complex questions that really get to the heart of what it is to be a human being. And I think we need to look at them as in their full complexity, we need to recognize that um, when we are striving for full inclusion and representation and diversity, that there are going to be people who are made very uncomfortable by that. And we need to learn how to recognize and manage that discomfort so that it doesn't disrupt the overall experience for everyone. And that so that it doesn't undermine what we're trying to do, which is bring people together and be a constructive community. So um, I wish that there were a shorter, easier answer. Um, uh, and and I, I would dearly love to find one, but it is an incredibly complex issue. We need to recognize that because ultimately we are all individually complex people. Um, and we have to recognize that sometimes something as minor as not having had breakfast can result in uh, experiences that are deeply unpleasant and outsized for everyone simply because somebody somewhere was short of calories. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not speaking about myself, obviously. <laughs> um, but, you know, so we, we do have to pull all of that complexity together and learn to do our best, live with it, and be forgiving. Thank you for your presentation, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, my question is about the pipeline and the mentorship. Um, how far back do you go and do you start? Because I know you said, you said with the pipeline, by the time you get to the end, it's just a few call. Like what if you started in, I don't know, secondary school? Because I know from my experience and with some friends I had, by the time we got to GCSEs, quite a lot of them that were interested in STEM subjects all of a sudden had no interest. Like, do you start mentorship from back down there, or like what kind of thing can you do to kind of you encourage it? So, um, you have to go back a little bit earlier than secondary school. Um, in, in, in fact, you start to see discrimination as in people treating uh, girls and boys differently at the stage of about ooh, pregnancy. <laughs> people treat the bump differently and they talk to it differently if they know that it's going to be a boy or a girl. So we are literally creating stereotypes <clears throat> from day minus quite a few. Um, and so we know, for example, that um, children as young as four <laughs> understand stereotypes and, and gender stereotypes. And we know that the cl more closely they understand gender stereotypes, the more closely they cleave to those stereotypes at age five. We know that girls, when they are developing their self-identity, so sort of through the sort of latter single digit years, um, they're starting to self-select out of STEM because they don't believe it's for people like them. Um, they don't see the role models, they're not encouraged, um, they become very aware of uh, the biases, so they start to, um, you know, your, your first part of identity development is dividing the world into kind of you and everyone else, and then it's dividing the world into male and female. This is for girls, this is for boys, I am a girl, that is for boys, that is not for me. And I, I've heard some real horror stories, you know, of uh, little boys throwing tantrums at the sandpit because um, the only spade available was pink. And we start to see um, serious issues coming when um, children, you know, they become very aware very quickly of colour differences. 
ink and blue. I mean, it's a curse. It's a genuine curse. It is destroying a uh, childhood to segregate Tories by gender the way that modern society has. Um, and by the time you get to secondary school, frankly, it's too late. The people that we can, the girls we can hang on to at that age are the ones who've already self-selected in, but need to be kind of encouraged and, and we need to keep them. If we want to go back, this is why I did the crochet patterns. If we want to really genuinely change this, we need a massive campaign for kindergarten children. Um, and I've, I've had many conversations about trying to, to work out how we would do that, but we're talking about massive societal change and that's difficult. So, as, as sort of uh, adults become more aware, and particularly fathers, I find that there's a really interesting um, thing, technical fathers, more so than um, men who are scientists, men in tech, when they have daughters, want their daughters to experience the same joy they did from, you know, coding and playing um, computer games and all that kind of stuff. And they suddenly realize that at, at some point in their daughter's sort of early years that it's hard for girls, that this is just not built for girls. And that that's when they kind of um, start to become quite active around gender equality. And I find that fascinating um, because I think there's a real um, opportunity there to bring fathers into the conversation more and um, <coughs> to start thinking about how we communicate with parents uh, more effectively about how parents can encourage their children you know because it's you know, good not just girls in stem if, if a young boy wants to um you know, become a primary school teacher that's like not really the done thing if they want to become a nurse um that's we need to be encouraging both girls and boys to do um things that aren't coded for their gender um, and we need to learn how to start a lot younger and um yeah, this is a whole other two, three hour rant that I could go on, but I will pass it over. <laughs> um, so, can you do this and also, um, it's not, like you said, it's not just the children that we need to get into STEM, it's the parents of the children, the teacher of the children. It's also, the leaky pipeline isn't just at the start. We feed lots of children into the pipeline, it's throughout. We need returnship programs, we need early careers and we need late careers programs. We need to be better about um, getting people back from maternity leave, making jobs attractive to women who care for children, who care for relatives. Um, we need to do all of those things. That's something that businesses, businesses need to do. That's kind of a societal change that needs to happen. That's something that the government needs to, to kind of encourage people to do as well. Um, what can we do? We can certainly put pressure. We each, I mean, I don't because I'm not a citizen, but most of you probably vote. So, you know, use it wisely, uh, campaign for certain, for, for things that you think are important, like talking to parents to be about gender stereotypes, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, we, we can all play a part in it, definitely. And the more of us play part in it, the easier it is. Um, but yeah, there are lots of holes to plug along the whole of the pipeline. It's not just like the part. So, like, I, I really, really agree with that. Um, but I do just want to mention on the kids' side of things, uh, Let Toys Be Toys, uh, an amazing campaign. Um, Let Books Be Books, run by basically the same people, also an amazing campaign. Being aware of um, what we show our children, the toys that we buy them, the books that we give them, and how those are shaping the way that they view the world and the way that they view themselves within that world. I mean, because ultimately we, we are narrative creatures, we exist on stories. You know, everything that we've said tonight has all been little stories and the stories that we tell our children, um, I would say over the last 15 years have become increasingly segregated by gender. And we need to be thinking about every last little detail and what that says about the world that these girls and boys are going to inherit and how they view their place in it you 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 cannot think outside of your own experience without a lot of help and children especially what they experience is their normal 
and that's their expectations. So we can't move children outside of their own experience particularly easily. They're, they're lucky they are very flexible, but we need to think much more closely about what the little things are saying to them and how we change that so that they grow up with a more expansive view of who can do what. Maybe the last couple of questions, if we have any left. Cool. I feel like we need to invite them much more often. <laughs> so thanks everyone. Thank you a lot. We'll be here. So please stay. Have another lovely day. So yeah, beautiful. And then yeah, let's chat then. Let's